theater, welcome to this video. Welcome to my home. It's been a long time since we've been able to make a video together and I'm really, really excited to have you here. So today I want to do a bit of a massage, mostly with your head and sort of working with your hair, which I've also been really looking forward to since you have such beautiful hair it's so silky and shiny and hopefully this is going to be a relaxing experience for you I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the work that you've been doing in terms of trauma work and homeopathy so we'll just kind of have a relaxing conversation that's also hopefully interesting for our viewers. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. First of all, I really love what you're wearing. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, this um, was a gift from my mother. It's silk. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle gave it to her um, mm. and he's from Saudi Arabia but I think originally it might have came from East Asia mm -hmm. I love it I love the silk it does feel really nice mm -hmm. and it's the perfect time in the summer to wear it so we're going to start off with kind of cleansing the area sort of cleaning your aura so I've asked you to bring this spray. It's an aura spray. Do you know what's in it? It looks like the words are all... Yeah, the words have been... <laughs> <laughs> You've had it for quite some time then. It has good energy in it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna spray it all over. You can keep your eyes closed. Decipher. It's a tricky one. <laughs> I think there's some ylang ylang. That's something that I've picked mm. up on. There's definitely some like spicy notes, maybe like a ginger or. Okay. It's hard to tell. But I wanted to use this feather today. Do you know which? bird it comes from? This might have come from a goose. Mm. A goose feather. They're quite abundant here, so yeah. we're lucky to have them. Let's see the cute babies in the spring. <laughs> Definitely. Moving front to back, up and down. And I want you to just raise your arms. <clears throat> Thank you. And I love how your top is just <laughs> flowing. I never worked with a feather before, but that felt really intuitive. I was gonna say you're natural.
So I'm just going to start with a very gentle scalp massage. Just kind of getting to know the contour of your skull and also activating some acupressure points. I'm also feeling for any muscles that might be tense. So I heard that you've been studying a lot today. Mm, yes. For botanical medicine. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so I can feel that you're trapezius here is quite tight a little more than the right side which is interesting hmm. I would say that your left side's also a little higher so we can definitely do a bit of work here, just kind of starting with some kneading of the traps. So just take deep breaths here. Good. Just gonna do a little bit of cross fiber friction back here. Just for loosening that up. Gonna find gallbladder twenty one, which is at the peak of the muscle, and I'm gonna just push down. So I want you to take a deep breath in. Good. Okay, and just release. Do that one more time. Okay, take a deep breath in. Good. And release. going to brush your hair out a little bit. And I'm really happy that you left your hair long. You grew it out.
Theodore, have you ever had anyone else brush your hair recently? Oh, not recent. Mm. It's been many years. <laughs> Do you remember who was the last person? My mother. Mm. <laughs> have you always left your hair long? Well, when I first met you, your hair was shorter. But previously... When I was in high school, I always wanted to have long hair. Um, do you know that character Legolas from mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings? Yeah. I wanted to have his hair. I said I wanted hair like that. But then I think that, you know, kids in high school, there there's a certain norm that you have to follow. So yeah. I was considered odd for mm -hmm. having um, long hair and of course my features were very feminine mm. so I was sometimes made fun of mm. most of the time that. so for some time of my life I stopped having the long hair because of that reason mm. and um, I decided to reclaim it because oh. I really love my hair <laughs> Beautiful. And Thank it's you. really silky soft right now. I just um, detangled it and it's super soft. Thank you. Are there any hairstyles? I've seen you do a bun before, but have you ever tried braids? No, I, um, in high school when I had long enough hair, people did braid it. Mm. But it's been a long time since then. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was really hoping to braid your hair. And I was thinking, well, in my culture, in Central Asian culture, we tend to do a lot of braids, no. women and men. Um, so I'm wearing two braids. But in Uyghur culture, for example, they do... Um, I think at least six braids, if not more. So I was actually thinking, well, it's up to you. How many, what number of braids would you like today? Six sounds like a fantastic number. Yeah. As long as you're okay with doing all of those. Absolutely. I would love to. I think that looks so good on you. We could probably do sort of like Maybe here, let's see how we can section this. My mom used to do these braids on me um, when I used to have like performances, like dance and singing performances as a child. She would always put my hair into these braids because like culturally that's what we did. Whenever it was a fancy occasion, all the girls would wear braids. Mm. But I believe in the nomadic Central Asian cultures, like the Kazakh, the Kyrgyz, sorry, and even the Mongolians, um, everyone wore braids just because it's a lot easier to keep your hair that way. But I think this would be a good way to section them. It's interesting that you say that, Sumita, because um, prior to the Western entry to what is now called the Philippines. Mm. Men and women wore their hair really long. Mm. And uh, it wasn't until the, the Europeans came that mm. short hair for men became a thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a common story of colonization all over the world like with our indigenous peoples in Canada or in Turtle Island and Central Asia and all of Asia really and it's a shame because I think hair is such a wonderful way to express your your soul and your spirit your personality and it's totally okay if you love short hair I think that's great but 
Yeah, I do. I do like the traditions and I'm, and I'm choosing to also grow up my hair even though it's very thin because I have, um, I have PCOS so I've had a lot of hair loss previously and it's not as thick as it used to be but I'm definitely inspired to grow it out. Mm. Okay, I think that's pretty good. So we can... And I have a bunch... I have a bunch of these. Oh. So I actually want you to sure. hold on to that. <laughs> and I also want to... So this is lemongrass and frankincense. Oh. Do you like I it? I love it. Frankincense is one of my favorite. Really? Boswellia. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I typically like like to put it around the head, like in a halo. Is mm -hmm. that okay if I do that? Absolutely. Okay. I feel honored if you anoint my head with oil. <laughs> It's kind of like a peppermint halo, but with the lemongrass and frankincense. Oh yes, I could smell the lemongrass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're going to start at the top of your head. I definitely feel, I feel very honored to be able to braid your hair today, so thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Thank you. I think the hair would definitely enjoy that new way of being because it hasn't been braided in years. Mm. <laughs> I'll be very gentle. And while we're braiding, I wanted to start a conversation about um, homeopathy. Because yeah. I know you've been, well, we've both been really interested in it, but especially you. Um, for viewers who don't know, Theodore and I go to the same school, uh, the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. And Theodore just finished um, his last year, so six years, right? Yes. Been there since <laughs> 2015. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. And you're all done now. Mm -hmm. Or all, you, the assignment, you're finishing yeah, almost up. Almost done. <laughs> but we'll consider it done. <laughs> yeah. And it's been difficult, but you've, you've learned so much and you've figured out sort of what you want to do, what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I know trauma work and homeopathy especially, as well as traditional Chinese medicine. So I'd love to learn more about, and I'm sure the viewers would love to learn more about how you got into homeopathy and where you see yourself going with that. Right, so I guess to start off with, um, naturopathy in North America, um, we use at least seven tools. Um, so, like pharmaceuticals, botanical medicine, which is the use of herbs, traditional Chinese medicine, which you use a lot in your videos, mm -hmm. hydrotherapy, which is the use of water and its different temperature to promote healing, mm -hmm. nutrition, how many have I listed? <laughs> There's an unlimited number of tools. <laughs> exactly. So, and one of those tools is homeopathy. So, homeopathy is not well understood by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's quite difficult to explain. So, I don't even know if I'm the right person to explain it. But what I do have to say is that, you know, um, if you're someone who is interested in learning about it, the best way to learn about it is to actually experience it. Absolutely. It's okay, I can pick that. <laughs> so to experience what happens, because it's it's almost unexplainable. It's kind of like magic. Like, how do you explain something so mystical and powerful at the same time? Mm -hmm. So I found 
my story with homeopathy is an interesting one because as um, some of you may know from my previous videos that uh, I, my background was in nursing and uh, I practiced nursing for 10 years. And so my educational background was um, very focused on the, the sciences, mm -hmm. the empirical science. I want to specify that because science is all encompassing. And it is. science is really curiosity, if you ask me. It's trying to find out how things work. And in mm -hmm. many ways, that's how homeopathy is. It's, a, it's an inquisitive curiosity and uh, a very privilege to be able to access the soul of another human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a very potent thing, if you can imagine. So you have to be allowed entry in, and oftentimes it is the homeopathic practitioner who is able to access parts of the person that is inaccessible to mm. a lot of people. So I kind of see it as, um, if you ever had watched Harry Potter and they take a piece of hair and then there's this memory that comes out, Mm. and you enter that world, it's almost as if it's like that because some of those memories in the subconscious are not even accessible to the person themselves. Mm. So, going with my story about how I first started homeopathy, I really owe it to my mentor and now great friend, um, Dr. Kimberly Blyden Taylor, who is now the chief medical officer at the um, Southwestern College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona. Yeah. Congratulations, Dr. KVT. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy for I wouldn't be here without you. So I took homeopathy first year. So back then we had to take it in all years. And um, it was so new to me. It was mind-blowing. Um, and my mind was not ready to be opened in that way. So I was very resistant to it because all I knew was the traditional science. Mm. And it was everything opposite from what I learned. Um, mm. Small dosages, everything, <laughs> the yeah. concepts. And so I actually ended up failing my first homeopathic class and I hated, absolutely hated it. I said, it's complete <laughs> nonsense. You know? <laughs> Why are we learning this? And uh, I ended up repeating it with, again, the same mentor and professor. Mm -hmm. which saved me from uh, the second year homeopathy um, professor who was teaching that, which I'm not really sure what happened there, but it turns out it wasn't a good experience for a lot of people. So I was, mm -hmm. I was saved, and I, I studied homeopathy, and for three years I had no idea <laughs> what I was studying. <laughs> and it wasn't until I was in year three, that I experienced a really, really deep depression. Um, mm. Just like yourself, I had a traumatic relationship, breakup, and that really caused this crevice to be opened. Mm. And um, a lot of the deep-seated traumas that had been buried mm. just surfaced. And this happened a couple of weeks, two weeks before my first board exam. So you can imagine what happened, yeah. <laughs> which is me failing. I, I had experienced a lot of failure in my life, but I, I see it as, a, uh, as an opportunity for growth. Mm. So it came to the point that I was already considering taking away my life because I found it extremely difficult to even wake up in the morning and get out of bed just to exist was work, and I didn't see any meaning to it. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, the world became a very dark and lonely and painful place. I remember going to sleep at night with this boring, drilling sensation that would start from the back of my heart, mm. piercing through, through my chest. Wow. And crying myself to sleep because I felt just completely hopeless. I felt didn't even had enough energy to feel sorry for myself. And um, I found 
I saw the world as a cruel place. And so Dr. KBT had an opportunity for one person to volunteer um, so she can demonstrate oh, what is homeopathy. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I was there in that class and I raised my hand. I said, I'm willing to, I'm willing to be a public demonstration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so she did the homeopathic interview. Mm. And it's like opening a Pandora's box. Absolutely. There is this just release. It's and did she do the constitutional with you? Or yeah. acute? She did constitutional. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's various methods to how a homeopath may do their, um, their art. And uh, the way I was trained was the classical homeopathy. And um, which is the original from Samuel Hanuman. So constitutional is like a primer, like it's a constitutional just means like the whole constitution of the person. So you really get to dive deep into the root cause of the, the disturbance, the energetic and physical yeah. disturbance. So she did it. I remember it was very, very long. Possibly mm. over two hours. <laughs> Just yeah. my nature of being very talkative. Mm. And lots of tears. And I remember her closing her book and saying, I gotta work on this. And what had happened was she didn't hardly slept for the next four nights wow. trying to look for my remedy. <laughs> wow. She read every book. <laughs> wow. her, searched far and wide, far and wide. And then finally she came to me very tired <laughs> with like bags under her eyes and oh she said, goodness. I think I might have found it. And uh, she told us a story and um, when she said what it was, I was just astounded because it was like coming home to me. It was finding yeah. a piece of me that was missing because yeah. the remedy that she has chosen was an orchid. And I grew up in the Pacific Islands, and we had a lot of orchids there. Mm -hmm. And I used to tend to orchids when I was a kid. They were just the most fascinating plants because they lived on trees, and they're very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And everything about them was kind of... <laughs> I was a version of that, you know. They're, they're quite sensitive, and they're very... Um, they're very particular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, orchids will only allow a certain species to pollinate them. Mm -hmm. They they have adapted so that they've evolved to a certain species, or vice versa. They've trained the animal to pollinate them. Yeah. Um, so after discovering that and finding out the nature of myself, which was this beautiful orchid, um, which was so exotic and nobody really understood because it was not a common sight to see. Um, we had a little ceremony where she had invited the classmates over to her house and um, my friends and we were there to witness the taking of the remedy. It was a very special night. And uh, so the remedy is, is just a pellet with the energetic substance of that orchid and uh, so I've taken it and after that um, more stuff came up mm. for several weeks and I remember sleeping 18 hours a day sometimes not even knowing what day it was when I woke up and um, slowly but surely the transformation started happening um, my mood started improving and the telltale sign of that was because I started pursuing actively the mm. things that really sparked joy in my life. My creativity blossomed and, uh, you know, I had my first business venture. After that remedy, I started creating these orchid displays and selling them. That's when you started that. Yeah. Wow. And that was my first time getting into business. 
and um, it's just like a whole part of me just blossomed mm. thanks to that remedy and yeah so thanks because of that experience it honestly saved my life but then there's the learning how to actually use it <laughs> mm. because I was the recipient of the energy gift mm. and so I spent then trying to find opportunities I thought I was going to go to Germany which is the origin of homeopathy to study it but with COVID-19 it was impossible mm. and Dr. KBT was kind enough to take me under her wing and uh it was the first time that she's ever taken any student. I love that you said take take you under her wing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she's a bird. <laughs> exactly. So, and it was just a fantastic experience. Her and I clicked really well, and she's taught me so much. And I'm just so honored and so grateful for her for teaching me mm. six semesters of homeopathy. <laughs> what a privilege. Yeah, and so now, in the near future, I'm intending to study more homeopathy. I looked at schools, and there is one special school for the viewers out there in England. <laughs> it's we called do have viewers in England. Oh, of course. Yeah, the School of Homeopathy. And um, in the near future, that's where I intend to study. Mm. And... Um, yeah, so that's my story about homeopathy. And I know you recently was a recipient of homeopathy as well. From you <laughs> and Dr. Kimberly Blyden Taylor. Um, but wow, I've never heard that story in full before. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing, not just to me, but to the whole world just now. Yeah. Uh, I hope the School of Homeopathy is watching <laughs> and I get accepted. <laughs> Let that be my application. <laughs> this, is the, this is the interview right here. Well, originally they have a sister school in Iceland, and I just absolutely love Iceland. Mm. But then I found out the whole thing is in Icelandic, so I yeah. would have trouble. You'd have to learn Icelandic to go there. But maybe they'll have um, field trips to Iceland. <laughs> maybe. Oh, I it's just not love too far. It. Right? Yeah. So that's how homeopathy came to my life. It was a full 180, mm. um, something that I absolutely hated and resented to something that was just life-changing. Mm. And so for anyone out there who's just curious or maybe is very skeptical about homeopathy, skepti of skeptics. skepticism is such a great thing because that's what it we is. do in homeopathy is that we always keep an open mind. Um, so... It, you know, we don't ever put our own bias or judgment or previous storytelling. The stage belongs to the person, to the client. And um, I just absolutely love that. I have studied, you know, so much psychology, trauma work. I mean, I was a mental health nurse after all. Mm -hmm. And I haven't found anything that just came close to the depth that homeopathy goes to into like the realm of the human spirit wow. so for anyone out there who's watching i encourage you to find a classical homeopath and um try it for yourself and here's oh, orchid. <laughs> look at that it's in full bloom i don't know if you uh, saw it before i did notice it i didn't know it was an orchid. It's a miniature. It it's is. a miniature philodendron. Oh. You can see time. how selective the orchid is when it comes to their pollinators because unlike most flowers which produce a lot of pollen, the orchid flower produces a single pollen and that pollen is located under this little lid for this um for this um, orchid flower, it's under there. So when the pollinator comes, whether it's an insect or a bird, it will flip open that lid and the pollen has a sticky sap that it'll get mm. stuck to. And then the next flower, it pollinates. The 
the receiving part of the orchid will then receive that pollen. So they're very specific as to who pollinates. And the orchid also has a very special relationship with fungus. Mm. Um, so in, because the, their seeds doesn't have an endosperm, meaning that mm. it doesn't have enough nutrients to actually propagate from itself. Mm. So what happens is that it forms a symbiotic relationship with a fungus, which kills off all other plants except the orchid so the fungus oh. nourishes the baby orchid oh. yeah so it orchids are fascinating yeah. <laughs> and then of course they have a symbiotic relationship with trees because they're epiphytes meaning mm. that they would um, position themselves on a tree although they're not parasitic but they do create a good decoration for the for the trees yeah, yeah. I would love to go to the Philippines and just see a tree with orchids, with orchids on it. yeah, I don't know how that would look like. It looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> if you come to my parents' home, there, there's just orchids in all the trees. <laughs> and they didn't even like plant them; they were just there. Oh yeah, they just grow anywhere, oh. and um, they just show up one day. You mm. can you can people just tie them on the trees usually with coconut husk, but um, they require very little care there because it, it's always humid, mm. and. Um, it's warm, which is the kind of environment that they like. Yeah. This Philanopsis, yeah. It's yeah. from Southeast Asia. <laughs> Thanks for sharing the orchid. And I wanted to share this one with you. Like, do oh. you remember it was dying and it was... Yeah. And it was so dehydrated and now it's got a bunch of roots. Oh. Although, I tried to put it into a medium. Yes. And it didn't like it. It right. started to get dehydrated right away, so I had to put it right back into the water. And it's recovering. I can mm -hmm. see that because it's growing its new roots over there. It is. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, a little, tiny little leaf in there coming up. Yeah, so for people out there of orchids, I really highly recommend not to throw the orchid after it's flowering, even if it looks dry. What you can do is you can put it in a glass like this with some water, and the orchid will learn to adapt to its new environment. That's what plants do, they adapt. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll start growing new roots, and before you know it, they'll flower once again. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you for reviving that orchid back to life. You did such an incredible, incredible job. Hey, Theodore, so now we have one, two, three, four braids. Mm. And I'm just going to put two more here. Okay. Hold on to this one. Did you want to share your experience with homeopathy as well? Oh, absolutely. So, as you can see in the back here, I have two setups. So on this side, we have sort of my... So I'm a golden eagle in homeopathy, and this is my section. And then I put Theodore's plant and orchid section here. And then it meets in the middle with this dream catcher that Theodore gifted me. And he actually bought this before he even found out what my remedy is. And it's, look at these golden feathers, yeah. which is so cool. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. I keep it in my bedroom. Um, but yeah, I, maybe I can show the camera this time. So in the Kazakh culture, which my dad is Kazakh, um, and also in Mongolian culture, many other nomadic cultures. So we have a tradition called eagle hunting and it's typically passed down from father to son and they take an eaglet from a nest and so capture it, which I'm sure is very traumatic for the eaglet and um, keep it in, under captivity for seven years and teach it how to hunt. And it seems beautiful. I mean, it it is, it looks from the outside a beautiful tradition, but I really feel for the eagle because they are often blindfolded and tied up. Their talons are tied up together, and they live this life in captivity away from their mother and their father and any other eaglets that were in the nest. And um, they, there's a lot of expectations to perform. Um, so there's eagle hunting competitions where the e eagle has to actually um, 
fly the perf the most perfect way and hunt in the perfect way and be beautiful and all of these things and I'm just gonna put this away. It's beautiful. So so there's this hunter and golden eagle relationship that I think is pretty toxic and I definitely have experienced that in my life in many ways um, with many different people in my life including in one of my relationships as well and so yeah it's it's pretty cool how we figured out what my remedy was because I my dad actually had a dream um, after I moved out from the home he dreamed that I it was baby Samita, like a toddler Samita running, and I ended up turning into uh, a golden eagle. And he tried to get me out, begged me to come out, and I wouldn't, and I would just stare at him with these like stern eyes. And he was crying, and eventually I just flew away. And so it was, he, you know, he's, <laughs> not very connected to subconscious but in his dreams you know that's when the sort of the, that prophecy kind of comes out so i think he subconsciously knew that i was a golden eagle mm. um, i also have a birthmark over here kind of like on the chest uh, area on the right side that i always thought since a young age was an eagle i'm not sure why i had like it could be anything <laughs> It's just a shape. Um, it's kind of like a triangle. It looks like it has a little wing and then it's like flying upwards. And I always thought it was an eagle. Um, and yeah, so I had like, I think it was also two hours that we had a homeopathic intake. And Dr. KBT couldn't quite figure out what I was. She thought I was a mineral. She had no idea that I was a bird. Um, but you knew I was a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, plants have a very special ability to feel through things. Like, I have a very poor vision, like eyesight, but I do f hear and feel everything. Mm. So whereas an eagle, for example, would have very good vision. <laughs> so right now I actually can't see anything without my glasses, <laughs> but I'm listening and feeling through the whole thing. Mm. So I just kind of felt my way through. Um, and also, I, I had a little bit of an advantage because we were working together for quite some time. And that's why when I created my process, the um, trauma transfiguration method, I designed it so that it does take you through the step by step with the online course and then the one on one so that there is time for all of that to unfold and unravel on itself. And yeah, so that way we don't just shock you know, a person into something that they're not ready for. Mm. Yeah. And you really, you really like <laughs> spread your wings. I mean, I could see you. Um, just even like, you know, I think our last video together was in October. I think it was November, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. one of those. Because uh, this was after a specific relationship. <laughs> yes. Okay. I remember the tree was golden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely fall. Yeah. Yeah. And you were still living in the older the home? The other home, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to see you transform, I mean, literally to leave the nest. Mm-hmm. And to spread your wings and to, to fly. Yeah, I've definitely grown in so many ways. Like, I had to learn, um... I had to learn to leave the hunter. There's such a strong attachment and almost an addiction to being with the hunter, to mm. showing them. Um, and the hunter showed up in many different ways. Like the, pa it was often patriarchal in my life. So there were different male figures, um, but also like my culture, for example, was an aspect of like the patriarchal mm. um, nature of my culture. Not all of it. There's so much that is so beautiful that I'm um, reclaiming and rediscovering. Um, but the patriarchal, uh, kind of oppressive nature um, that is inherent in the Central Asian culture, unfortunately, that was also another big thing that I had to acknowledge that was there, and I had to learn to be free of it. And I, I was realizing, okay, so 
I was the golden eagle in captivity, but now mm. I'm free. But mm-hmm. even though I'm free, even though seven years has passed, I still need to work through all the trauma that had built up in order to actually be free. So it was interesting, um, viewers, if you look at Adia's video with me, the most recent one, um, I drew a card that said freedom and it was a bird. It was a red cardinal mm. and it was in a cage and the door was open, but the cardinal wasn't leaving. So mm. I was like that cardinal and I had to learn how to realize that I am powerful. I am free. I just have to learn to process my trauma and be free of that. And so that's what the homeopathic remedy really helped me kind of step by step work through a bit more, a bit more of that that sort of hunter eagle um, mm. trauma. And now you have this new interest or maybe uncovered, you know, this passion with the trauma work. Yes, definitely. And that was because of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're we're collaborating together to make it, you know, available for people. And yeah. I'm so excited for what's to come. Me too. Yeah, so Theodore just told me that he wants me to be one of the, I guess, teaching assistants, sort of? Yeah, like one of the co-instructors um, of the online course. So last year, um, when we did our last video, I launched a course. That was the first time the, lo- the course was launched, and it mm-hmm. was really successful, and people really loved it. And uh, the course really prepares people to um, be ready for the one-on-one um, intensive work that we do. We do mm-hmm. need to prepare people before, you know, before they climb Everest. They need to um, be able to acclimate and to control their ear pressure and to know how yeah. to use the equipment and the tools. So it's kind of like that. So, but in this case, we're diving really, really deep as opposed to climbing really, really high. Um, homeopathy has that effect and certainly as a part of trauma processing. So the course is a 10-week course that um, we've designed so that people can be taken step by step to obtain those tools and those skills so that they're ready to dive really deep for the one-on-one. And it's a 10-week course, and it's going to be fun to have you Mm -hmm. there to co-teach it and... um, like both of us learning step by step along the way and you're you're going to be my mentor in many ways <laughs> um not just this trauma work stuff but homeopathy and then also in terms of my spiritual growth as well oh i'm so honored yeah. i'm so honored because that's I'm what really happy. <laughs> that's what my mentor had done for me um you know she was really like alive when she was seeing me learn and then now that that opportunity is, is given to me to, you know, enable somebody to pass that torch and then light the world on fire <laughs> with light, you know, it's just, it's such an honor. So thank you. And thank you for yeah. everyone who's interested in um, joining us. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to see you. So your braids are all ready. And oh. I can, well, there's a mirror over there and I can show you in a bit, but I think it looks pretty Mm -hmm. good. I can feel it. Yeah. There's a new sense of, a new sense of dimension (laughs) to the hair. I love that. Yeah. So I wanted to end this off. Mm. Oh, I realized I totally forgot to light those candles, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) So what are these called, Theo? Um, I call them Tinkerbells. <laughs> Tinkerbells? <laughs> They're like gongs. Mm. Um, meditation. And we got this one from the Buddha Center here in Toronto, the Paramita Buddha mm. Center, where my Buddhist teachers are from. And, uh, yeah, so it's just used to clear the space with sound, and, um, it's a good way to open or close a, a session. Yeah, so we're going to use this to close the session. Um... So I think you did it kind of like... Mm. Just close your eyes.
Thank you so much. Thank you. This was really such a pleasure and I'm looking forward to the next video and I'm looking forward to your YouTube channel. It's coming yes, soon. the YouTube channel is coming soon and our online course which is coming this fall and um, they can go to my new website, traumatransfiguration.com. I didn't know there was a new one. <laughs> traumatransfiguration.com. It's the same one, which is a different name. Cool. <laughs> and, so we'll uh, have all of that linked in the description. Mm -hmm. So definitely check it out, and we'll see you all soon. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>